great to see you, great to see you online as well. It was a creepy, dark, stormy night, typical night, and young Brenton Wynn was at his lowest point in his life. From the age of 14, he began hanging out with a bad crowd, and he started to experiment with illegal substances, alcohol, drugs, and by the age of 16, he would tell you that he was a full-blown meth addict, was absolutely depressed, down and out, suicidal. In fact, at one point, he was so down and out, he was angry with everyone, he was homeless, didn't even have a car to live in, and he was stumbling through the streets in a drug-fueled rage, mad at the world, and he finds himself in a dark parking lot, and when he looks up, he's kind of in this altered state, and he sees a cross and a church, and his anger flares up even more. He's not only mad at the world, he's mad at God, because this life stinks. This is not what he wanted. He knows he's addicted. He knows he thinks he's beyond hope. So he looks at the church, it's darkened, and he says, I am going to take out my anger here. And he goes up to the glass doors and he shatters them and he breaks in. And for the next hour, he goes on a drug-fueled rampage in this church and begins destroying the worship center, ruining the instruments, flipping over the pulpit, destroying the computers, the cameras, the laptops, everything of value. By the time the cops could come and interrupt this rampage, he had tallied up over $100,000 worth of damage. And then the cops had to make the phone call to the pastor and tell him what had happened. The pastor said, first thing Monday morning, I want to meet with the prosecutor. So he meets with the prosecutor, who is also a friend of the judge, and the three of them get together. The pastor incredibly says, I just feel like we need to give this guy some hope. I just feel like he is redeemable. He's not a hardened criminal. This isn't his, you know, 18th offense. This guy, he wasn't even in his right mind when he was doing all this. Can we do something? And they got their heads together and he said, you know what? There is a place called Renewal Ranch. And if he agrees to go to that for the next year, there's a chance that the judge will allow the up to 20 years prison sentence and incarceration to not be the option. So they bring it to Britain Wynn and they say, you choose. And he chose Renewal Ranch, wouldn't you? And he went, and it was an incredible, awesome, godly place, over 300 acres, and, and it had you know, Christian counseling and 15 hours of seminary-led Bible studies and 300 hours of community service, I think every month that they had to accomplish it. It's this incredible thing. Over the course of the, this few years that this ministry has been open, over 300 men had come to faith in Christ, including Brenton Wynn. Brenton Wynn, in fact, would go on just six months After going on a rampage, he would stand in the baptistry of the same church he tried to destroy and would profess Christ. What was cool was what the owner of Renewal Ranch said. He said, get this. He said, our goal isn't just to get them off of drugs and alcohol. It's not just to have them be abstinent from that. Our goal is to have them fall in love with Jesus. And then to take that love outside and to make disciples of others, to be self-reproducing disciples. That is the goal, and I love that because they take Jesus' word seriously when he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Isn't that interesting? Notice Jesus didn't say, go and be disciples. He says, go now. Your job, Being a disciple is a foregone assumption. It's now our job to go and make disciples disciples. This was so important to Jesus. These are his last words. As he ascended from the Mount of Olives, he said, hey, I'm leaving, but go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see this happen. We're going to be baptizing at the end of this month, October 25th. And if you are a disciple and you haven't followed through with that, now is an awesome time to talk to us about that. Because this is a powerful moment in Britain Wynn's life. They lived out the mission to make disciples. So let me ask you a question. You at home, you can chime in on this. If someone came to you today and said, what is a disciple? How would you say, how would you answer that? What would would be your response? 
And how do you qualify to be one? Do you just say, I'm in, sign me up? Or, you know, you could do a Google search. You could look at the clinical definition of it and say it's a noun. It means a follower, a student, a teacher, a student of a leader or a philosopher. And that's good. I mean, I guess simply put, you could say a disciple is someone who follows Jesus' teaching. You know, maybe a, a Christian. Right? We like that title. We're real comfortable with that. So I'm a Christian. There's just, there's just one problem with that. Jesus never used that term. In fact, it's only used three times in all of the New Testament. And it came really out of a derogatory term. It was actually meant as an insult. They were so mad, people at that age, they were so mad at, at Jesus, and they called him a troublemaker, and they went, oh, no, please tell me you're not one of them. <laughs> please tell me you're not a follower of that Jesus, that rabble-rouser. He's, you're, you are just like him. You're like a little Christ. That's what Christian means. It means a little Christ. You're, you're like little Christ. You're, you're, you're just like, oh, to be known as such good imitators of Jesus today that people would call you and me a little Christ. When's the last time somebody called you that? By the way you live. By the way you make disciples of others. By the way you take your faith seriously enough that it actually means something. It's not just a country club. If you would ask the Apostle Paul, hey, what's a disciple? How would you define that? I think Paul would say a disciple is someone who can say, it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In fact, I think he would go deeper, you know, especially in an age of a pandemic. If he were here today, he would say, all disciples are Christians. We get that. But not everyone who claims to be a Christian is a disciple. Let that sink in. So we can come. We can sing the songs. We can tune in online. We can listen to a sermon. We can even give a, a tip to God every now and then. You know, thanks God, a little nod. We can maybe plug in here and there and show up. But y'all, if we are not sharing our faith and we're not applying what we're hearing, what we're learning, are we really living the life of a disciple? Because a true disciple hungers for God's word, hungers for life change, and also hungers to share that with someone else. That's why we say all the time, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where I found great food, and it's free. It's already been paid for. But we're so focused on this world. We're so focused on our problems. We're so focused on so many distractions, and we don't even look at what's real and lasting and of eternal significance. But it wasn't much different back in Jesus' day. Let me set the context for what we're about to read, because Jesus has had huge crowds coming to him now. Big crowds. It's just a problem with that. Jesus isn't impressed by big crowds, because he knows as the days go on, the crowds will thin out, because real discipleship is costly. Real discipleship says, hey, you need to count the cost before you follow me. Are you sure you want to do this? Oh, yeah, Jesus, we're with you. We're going to go down by the quad. We're going to have a great time. And he's like, you really count this cost? Because I'm going to ask you to give up everything. Yeah, we're with you. And here's, here's the dirty little secret about this. The closer Jesus got to the cross, the smaller the crowds got. By the time he got to the cross, it was a handful. Even though he was feeding thousands of people and healing countless numbers, the real proof was in the pudding. Who showed up with him? Who went the distance? So Jesus is about to make a hard saying here. I'm giving you a heads up. If you're listening at home or you're listening to this long, you know, on a podcast later, this is one of the hard sayings that is so quoted and misquoted. Brace yourself. Jesus is about to drop the mother of all politically incorrect statements. It wasn't correct then. It's certainly not correct today. He's about to use a word that is anathema to us. All right? So brace yourselves. Look with me. Luke 14. Here's what he says, starting in verse 25. He says, now, great multitudes went with them, and he turned to them, and he said, Hey, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife, his kids, brothers and sisters, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. What? <laughs> what? Did Jesus seriously just use the word hate? And did he seriously just use it in relation to his family members, his wife, his kids? That's why it is so vital to know the context of that word, in that sentence, in that time period. Remember, this is breaking news. In the biblical times, they didn't speak King James English. I know a lot of us think, you know, that the Lord came down and gave Moses tablets engraved in King James English, but he didn't. It was originally you had Hebrew, then we had Aramaic and Koine Greek and all kinds of different languages coming. They didn't have the English word hate. Their word for this did not include fear and loathing and anger and animosity and wanting to hurt somebody. That is not what hate what their word for hate meant, it meant to put something in a lower position. 
than something else. So when you look at it in the biblical context, back then to hate something simply meant to put something in a less priority. Like this pyramid right here. We look at this. This is how we view it in modern New Testament times. We see God. We see family, home, church. We're comfortable with this. This wasn't how the ancient Jews thought. Number two was actually number one. Number one was number two. Three, four, and five were way down the list. There was other cultural things that were important. So when Jesus shows up and he's saying, I'm not encouraging you guys to loathe your families. This was radical. He's saying, he's, see, we get this thing, we're like, I hate people, you know, you should hate your kids. You should, this is not some gothic, emo, little teenage kid who's just out of his mind, I, I hate my kids, I'm spiritual. I hate my wife, I'm spiritual. He's not wearing all black, he's not a goth, emo guy. Some of you get, you know what I'm talking about. Not all slouching around. I'm so spiritual, I even hate myself. <laughs> That's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus is saying something so radical back then, because back then he is saying, guys, God must come before everything. Until you put this in the proper order, and until you read on, this is self-interpreting. This scripture actually illuminates itself. He's not done. He's about to drop another hammer. Look at verse 27. He says this, and whoever does not bear his cross and come at, y'all, this was incredible for him to even bring up the cross. Think about what's about to happen. Whoever doesn't bear his cross and come after me can't be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, doesn't sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he's laid the foundation, he's not able to finish, and all those who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build a tower, he wasn't able to finish, ha, ah, look at this, you should be so embarrassed. What king is going to go to war against another king, and he doesn't sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000? to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has can't be my disciple. Now, this is incredible. There is so much gold, so many truth grenades hiding right here. In the Old and New Testament times, family took precedence over everything. So when Jesus shows up and he makes a statement that God has to be the center of your life, this is radical. This has serious implications back then because it's requiring followers to truly count the cost because the crowds were coming. It was getting bigger and bigger. People were like, oh, Peter and James, if you've watched The Chosen, he's like, Jesus is it. Let's go. Let's have the revolution. He's like, mm, my time's not coming. This is what I'm talking about. We, we, can, we got enough people. Look at this big crowd. But he saw that they began to fade away because he turned. He says, you really want to be my disciple? You sure about that? Because it's going to cost you more than you think. Oh, don't get me wrong. It's going to be worth it. Oh, boy, is it going to be worth it. Wait till you hear the good news. But before you get there, I want you to count the cost because being a disciple will change everything. And that's our first lesson. Straight out of the gate, our love, our loyalty, our devotion for Christ must supersede everything and everyone else. And you don't hear that. So you know I got to ask, as your friendly neighborhood pastor, <laughs> how you doing with that? Does your love for Jesus supersede everything? Jesus just said it himself. He says, if anyone comes to me and doesn't put God above his own father, his own mother, his wife, his kids, his brothers, yes, even his own life, then he cannot be my disciple. And again, Christ is not advocating that anyone hate anyone. And if you know Jesus, you know that's not true. That's not, that would be fake news. He is not indicating you to hate anyone, let alone our family members. He's making a contrast between priorities of love. And to be Christ's true disciple, our obedience to him has to take priority over everything, even if it goes against what people expect of you, even if it goes against what your family members may think. Wow, pastor, you mean everyone? People have these wishes, these expectations on me? Yeah, Jesus is your highest standard. Man, that's a hard saying. How are you going to hit us out of the gate? That's just point number one. These are hard sayings. This is why it goes down as one of the hardest sayings Jesus ever taught. He's saying, if you make the decision to follow me, get ready for misunderstanding. Get ready for people to criticize you. Get ready for opposition from people you love. It can be painful to follow Jesus. And up until recently, in America, we haven't felt that. We haven't heard that. We've got everything. This is the greatest country ever. We have freedom. We can come and go. We can do. I mean, let's be honest. This pandemic is revealing 
Sometimes our choices will look ridiculous to those who do not know the Savior. Sometimes when you stand up for the Lord at school, at your office, you will be in direct opposition to what the world teaches. And they'll look at you and they'll scratch their head and say, what is different about you? And you have a chance to make disciples. You have a chance to speak up and say, you know what? I was once like this, but now I'm like this. This is what Jesus did for me. And then he leads into verse 27, where he tells us, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And that's the second requirement for discipleship. Dying to self. Ooh, how you doing with that? That's not fun. <laughs> be honest. You don't wake up in the morning, your feet hit the thing. I can't wait to die to myself today and just put all of my goals and desires in submission to someone else. That's not our natural flesh. It takes the Holy Spirit. Y'all, here's the problem. Sometimes we think our cross to bear is like a hardship. Like, oh, that's just my cross to bear. That's just my burden. Maybe it's an illness or a tough situation. Anybody ever hear that? You know, it's just my cross to bear. Y'all, that's not what Jesus was talking about here. He's not talking about a hardship. He's not talking about, oh, that's just kind of a painful experience. I should do that. Never forget the cross was an instrument of execution. The cross resulted in death 100% of the time. It wasn't just like an execution, a, a, a sentence of punishment. Never did they say, all right, your punishment is to be on the cross for two hours. And then we're going to take you down, we're going to heal you up, put you in the infirmary, and then you're going to go about your business. The cross was a death sentence, and it was torture. It was the worst thing Romans could dream up to hurt somebody, and it went on for hours. But here's our problem. We've lost that. We, we don't get the truth of that. Because we've beautified it. We think the cross, we, you know, we see gold plated, we see diamonds on it, we think, woo, we even hang it around our neck like a nice piece of jewelry. Man, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's kind of lost the truth of what Jesus is saying when he said, take up your cross. He was about to do that. This is an instrument of execution. If I were to put that in modern day terms today, it would be like me taking an electric chair, <laughs> gold plating it, and wearing this to the, to the party. And I come bebop and I'm like, hey, what's that? It's like, oh, this, you like this? This is my electric chair. <laughs> it's gold plated, 14 karat. Isn't it fabulous? That would be, you, are you kidding? Do you see this? We would, nobody would do that. that. You want to talk about shocking? Oh, what a horrible pun. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. This would be the most shocking thing. People walk in and go, hey. That's a nice electric chair. You want one? If you host three parties, you get a free one of these online. It's awesome. You can do that. Everybody sign up for it. Y'all, we have, we have lost the impact of the cross. Nothing wrong with wearing it. I have several, and you have several. But think of it as an execution. When Jesus says, take up your electric chair, crucify yourself in it, follow me, he's talking about putting your desires below his. Remember, we are supposed to be attached to Jesus. We are supposed to be detached from our former life, detached from our former lifestyles, and submitted to Jesus alone. He sets the agenda, not my feelings, him. Are you willing to do that? Because when we say, God, you are everything, I am going to be a Christ follower, it's not our feelings that dictate what's right and wrong anymore. It's not my bias, it's not my echo chamber of what I consume in the news. It's not my own human limited wisdom. It's not my own limited ever-changing science. All of everything I consume should submit to what I've discovered through God's word and what I've discovered in being a disciple of Jesus. Everything. Y'all, that changes everything. Because when you stand up today and you unashamedly say, I follow Christ and his word says this is right and this is wrong, do not think you will be applauded. It is not easy to stand up and be a disciple today. And it's only going to get harder. Let me encourage you, it's worth it. The darkness is looking for your light. You have a chance. Remember, things are going to be redefined. Are you willing to stand up when they say, oh, no, 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 that, that used to be good, but that's not good anymore. That's evil. And this, what we all used to know for thousands of years, this was evil, this was wrong. No, 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 suddenly, that's good. Are you willing to be mocked? At a minimum, 
Are you willing to be called every name in the book? Racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe, Islamophobe, science phobe? Are you willing? Because it's coming. Some would say it's already here. Isaiah warned us about this. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We see that. What about you at home? You willing to stand on truth when it's unpopular? If the world had nothing better than a cross for Jesus, why do we expect anything less? Because we grew up in America, we have things so easy, so laid out in front of us. And that leads us to the third truth that he's talking about here. Discipleship is costly. As you go on and you read this, Jesus uses two huge stories to illustrate this truth. The first one describes the importance of counting the cost before building a tower. And I love this illustration because he's describing people walking by, and every day, you know, it's like your neighborhood, they watch, oh, they've laid the foundation. Oh, they've got the wall. They've had the walls up just under studs for like two years. What is going on? They've run out of money. Ha, 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 right? It's just like Drax. You just said, you must be so embarrassed. I can't believe that. That's what I picture. Am I weird? This is what I picture. I picture Drax going by and saying, I can't believe you didn't finish your tower. You must be so embarrassed. So Jesus uses that illustration. Then he goes on and he uses a great one about war. And he says, you better evaluate the army's strength before going to war. In other words, you better count the cost. Because the days of signing up for an easy gospel and thinking that it's nothing but good times and only taking the benefits, that is not the message of Jesus. And if you've been sold that, you've been sold half the story. Because a disciple of Jesus will likely face the same things Jesus faced. Remember, the goal is to be known as little Christs. And that's not popular. But it's right. I love how Billy Graham put it. He said, salvation's free, absolutely. But discipleship, ooh, buddy, that'll cost you everything you have. Jesus, he said, man, you leave everything behind. Be devoted fully. These disciples and us today, be ready to endure hardship and suffering and scorn and mocking and persecution. And yes, maybe one day martyrdom. If anybody says following Jesus was easy, they didn't tell you the whole story. See, we've had it so easy here in America. Think about this. Up until the last 30 years, you could look around on a given Sunday in America and see over half the country assembling together, worshiping together, and fellowshipping together in church. Did you know that? Our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation. It was a foregone conclusion, not only by believers, but by non-believers, that Sunday this was going to be a day protected where you would come together and you would assemble and become the bride of Christ. And you would encourage each other. And you could cry and you could weep and you could laugh and you could rejoice and encourage and you would have all this koinonia. But something has happened in the last 30 years. You look, even all the way in the 1990s, here's the latest stats that have just come out. Think about this. In the 90s, now we're at 45% weekly attending. This was April of this year. The latest statistic I find, 29%. You ready? This is pre-pandemic. That number is less than half now. Less than half. You say, oh, pastor, the good news is everybody is just online. <laughs> oh. oh, how I wish that were true. Oh, how I wish that were true. The stats are in. Trust me, pastors have hired statisticians all over to look into this. Carrie Newhoff, one of the greatest ones. Extensive studies and data have come in, and the heartbreaking statistics is this. Of that 29%, of the half who people have not seen since March, less than 42% of people, these are people who claim to follow Christ, less than 42% of people have engaged in a single online worship service in 32 weeks. I did the math. That's 224 days with zero interaction with the bride of Christ. So, oh, no, no, they're, oh, we're, we're looking, you know, I mean, it's, it's no, no, we can tell because we can see who's logged on and we can see when you engage. That's why it's so important that you chime in. We know you're there. A shepherd can't pastor sheep that he doesn't even know where they are. 
We think, well, you know, Pastor, you don't understand. That has nothing to do with my commitment. I still love God. I support the work of the Lord. Man, my heart is with it. I'm advancing the kingdom sort of somehow. I'm sold out. You can count on me. <laughs> you can count on me. I will die for my faith. I will go to jail for my faith, Pastor. And then I saw this sign this week that said, don't say you'll go to jail over your faith when you won't even go to church for it. And I laughed at first. I went, wow, that's pretty sobering. Y'all, can I be honest? It's worse than that. We have now statistics that say half of the people won't even go to their sofa to engage in an online experience. Think about that. Won't even go to the sofa to engage. Over half the people who have drifted away have said we're still faithful, but they have not engaged one time with an online service. You ever hear the saying, you can tell people all day long something, but your actions tell a different story? Or I can't hear what you're saying because your actions are speaking so loud? This is powerful. Now apply that mentality to being a committed disciple of the Lord in one of the darkest times in humanity. When people need to see our light the most. I love what Kerry Newhoff, the church growth expert, he, he, he said, I'm going to talk about the casual Christianity and how that day is gone. He said, what I've noticed is infrequent engagement online and infrequent attendance on site is usually a sign of diluted devotion. In other words, infrequent engagement is a sign that our devotion is waning. It is being diluted. Now hear me, this is not an absolute rule, but it is a correlation. I want you to think about this. If somebody used here, Milo, stand here. If somebody used to, let's say Milo, used to be a fully committed disciple. He was attending faithfully. He was giving regularly from his job. He was supporting. He was plugged in a small group. He was discipling. He was inviting people regularly. If he was doing that, and then with the snap of fingers, he's now doing none of that, would you generally assume he is growing closer to God now? Or drifting. In other words, let's say Milo accepts Christ. Would it be good advice for me to come along as a pastor and say, in your new walk with Christ, I hope you do this 100% on your own. <laughs> you don't need anybody. Just go be a lone ranger. No, you wouldn't say that. But that's what people are doing. This is incredible. Being a committed Christian is not easy. So if somebody wants to begin a relationship with Christ and we want to make a disciple, would you advise them to do the Christian life 100% on their own? Maybe occasionally seeking out a nice podcast or maybe dropping by when it's convenient or you felt it was safe? Y'all, I'm never going to feel the world is safe. It never has been safe. It never will be safe until the king of kings comes back and makes all things new. Life is a risk. And people are looking and they need to see us. And all of this is driving to verse 33. Look what he says. He says, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all he has can't be my disciple. And I know I'm preaching to the choir with this because you guys are here. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you guys are right there. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to tag somebody who's guilty of this and send it. I'm kidding. Don't do that. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Don't do that. Unless you want to. Unless you... <laughs> the fourth requirement for discipleship is full surrender of all we own. Full surrender. Everything we have. Everything that comes into our being. Jesus, remember when he had the, uh, the rich young ruler came to him? He said, teacher, I've been doing great. I've been doing all these things, obeying all these commands since I was a kid. What do I do now to inherit eternal life? What is it? Tell me, tell me, I'll do anything. And Jesus says, okay, I'll tell you what. Sell all you have, give it to the poor. Remember the guy's reaction? It says he went away sad. Why? Why did he go away sad? Because Jesus knew this young man was too attached to his possessions to truly be a fully devoted disciple. He saw that. The Greek word that Jesus used here for forsake, it literally means to renounce or abandon one's right to ownership. Think about that. To renounce it. Say, I don't even own this. This is all your here. This is what it's not saying. The Greek word here does not imply selling all your possessions and giving everything away to the poor. That's not what this is saying. 
It's not saying sell everything you have and go broke and declare bankruptcy, right? This is not your chance to be Michael Scott, stand up on your Dunder Mifflin desk and say, I declare bankruptcy and think everything's going to be wiped away. This is not your Michael Scott moment. This is transferring your right of ownership to the proper master, to being a good steward of everything he's given you, to use all your resources, your time, your treasure, your talents to advance the kingdom. So you know i got to ask, how you doing with that? Because this right here changes everything. I remember being a spoiled teenage, typical American kid. Man, I had everything. And when I had a chance to do some missionary work in communist and socialist Romania and Czechoslovakia and all these atheistic communist countries, y'all, my eyes were opened. I saw people who were truly sold out disciples of Jesus, giving everything, risking just assembling being arrested and throw away the key type arresting. And I looked at these people and they gave up everything, surrendered to be a disciple, and they did it with joy. And it humbled me and it revealed, it showed a bright light on my own American dream of just accumulating things and wealth just to have a life of ease and comfort. See, I was having an attachment to the things that made me feel good in this world. I was more concerned about having a life of ease and comfort. Look at your neighbors. This is what we do. Y'all, that's not the gospel. You know what that is? That's the American dream. Sometimes we get those things mixed up. Awfully quiet. Sometimes we get these things mixed up and we think, well, you know, if God, if I, if I obey right, God's going to bless me with a great easy life. That's not the gospel. That's what we wish the gospel was. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that too honest? I love what Dr. Charles Stanley said. He said, a true disciple of Christ walks through this life with a detachment from the things of this world in order to become fully attached to Christ. Wow. There's the standard. It's not my stuff. It's not my distractions. It's not my job. It's Jesus. And living in such a way that when I walk down the street or I walk into a room, people go, oh boy. <laughs> Something different about this guy. Watch him. I don't know what he loves that Jesus guy. <laughs> Whatever. And we rub off and they say, you know what? When the hard times come, they don't go find their buddies to ask for wisdom and advice. They come seek you out because they know the rubber meets the road and they see there is something different. Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel offered a God, to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. I want to zoom in on those last six words. Though he died, he's still speaking. Can you believe this? He's still speaking. Y'all remember this, this story that came out? I might have mentioned it on a Wednesday night or a Sunday about this creepy new trend in, in graveyards and cemeteries. Anybody heard about this? All right, I'll tell you, if you haven't heard about it, a band, you guys can go ahead and come on up and get in place. I'm going to land the plane with this. There is this creepy trend in graveyards where they come up and you see these tombstones, right? <clears throat> and most of them are static. And, you know, they don't do anything. But if you stand in front of one long enough in these new tombstones, they come to life. And they reveal they're not actual tombstones. They're 48-inch LCD TVs that start to play all these stories and moving pictures of the person's life. And the person who's died literally comes and gives an interview and tells you, hey, this is what I've done, this is what's important to me, and they go on and they share all these things, videos and pictures and sound, and y'all, it's actually very powerful and very moving. So imagine being able to record our testimony for the world. And everyone who walks past our graves can hear about Jesus. Imagine living our life in such a way, man, this gives new meaning to that verse, though he died, he still speaks. So last night I got my kids together. We all sat on our bed and I said, I want to ask you something. If I died, what would you put on my tombstone? <laughs> I want, that's your challenge, by the way. I want you to do this, okay? Get ready to be illuminated, all right? I asked, I said, what, what do you think? What would be my last words? What would I say? Without missing a beat, Milo said, huh, you would probably say, well, this was almost fun. <laughs> It's pretty good. I do say that a lot. Another one of my kids says, I told you this would happen. 
husband. Okay, all right, that's a good one. I'd probably say something like that. And then another one who shall remain nameless said, you probably put something humble like, you're going to miss me. <laughs> I said, wow. I got to thinking about it, and I thought, you know what, when this day comes, I just want one sentence. Just one. It would make me immensely happy and immensely honored if someone were to put on my gravestone, here lies a disciple of Jesus. If I could have that, I've done my job well. Because I know I'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. Enter into the joy of your rest. Well done. Well done. Here lies a disciple of the Lord Jesus. As disciples, as followers of Christ, hear me. We can leave a legacy of faith and obedience. We don't know when we're called on for our final day. We don't know if we're going to be called upon for martyrdom. We don't know where the world is spinning. We do know this. It's going to get worse before it ultimately gets better. That's why I'm so passionate to encourage you. Live your life as a legacy. It is so worth it. The rewards that wait you far outweigh any momentary trials and struggles. Leave behind a testimony of a Christ-devoted life that's centered on loving God and loving people, serving God and serving people. Always striving to be a faithful disciple. What is your tombstone going to read? Maybe God spoke to you today. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray in just a minute. We'll open up the altar. We're going to sing, I surrender all. We're going to have a moment. Maybe God's laid something on your heart. Just be obedient to him. Maybe you want to stand and make that an altar right where you are. Just be obedient. Maybe you're at home and you want to turn off the distractions and just focus and say, God, I commit my life to you. I want to be a disciple. Just be obedient. Let's stand together and let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this moment. As you brought us to this climactic time, God, renew our heart to have a heart of a true disciple. God, tune out the distractions in our life. May we be focused on you, the main event, the thing that will last. May we leave a legacy that points people to you. Forgive us for the times we've gotten off the track, off the road. Bring us back. Thank you for being a God of second and third chances and being so gracious. Just like the boy in our opening story, Lord, we are redeemable because you are our redeemer. And we love you and we're thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.